Our guest today is former CMS administrator Seema Verma. Seema is a fierce, tireless crusader for higher quality, more affordable health care for over 100 million Americans. She has led one of the largest agencies in the U.S. government and taken on the toughest challenges in the largest sector of our economy. Seema's annual budget, I believe, is right around a trillion dollars. That's way bigger than the Pentagon. She buys more stuff, more healthcare services and diagnostics procedures than anyone in the world. And while doing that over the past four years, SEMA has brought transparency, accountability, and smart reforms to the vital mission of CMS with an emphasis on speed, innovation, and operating excellence. She led truly historic efforts in value-based care, which we're going to talk about, and interoperability. I like to say that she liberated data which had been incarcerated, had been trapped in order to get transparency. And important for our conversation, she drove agency-wide initiatives using OKRs for goal setting, improving the culture of CMS with focus, alignment, commitment, tracking, and stretching for really audacious goals. Her passion for progress really was evidenced in an emphasis on outcomes, not process. So progress through outcomes, not process. She streamlined, accelerated, and funded programs for telemedicine, testing, nursing homes, and much more. So Administrator Seema, it's wonderful to have some time with you today. And I'd uh, uh, love to thank you at the outset for your courage, your service, and your leadership. Tell me and our Measure What Matters community more about CMS and the organization you've been leading. Sure. So CMS Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Services, people think about it just Medicare and Medicaid. But one of the roles that the agency also has is they run the individual markets, the exchanges. So we've probably heard a lot about that more recently. They also have a division called CMMI, and uh, this is our innovation center. And so not only are they running the programs, but they're supposed to have a mission about moving us to more value-based payment and payment reform in medicine. So really trans transformation of healthcare was, was one division. Um, another area we have is our quality and safety division. And people think about that in terms of metrics, but that particular component of CMS essentially regulates the entire healthcare system. They're the ones that are setting the standards. They're the ones that are inspecting a variety of different healthcare facilities across the country. So the agency, 140 million Americans that are served by CMS, but essentially jurisdiction over the entire healthcare system. Tell me some numbers, some size, the numbers of employees or transactions or revenues that give us some sense of the scope and complexity of this. Sure. So it's about a $1.3 trillion budget. You have about the mix is about 68, almost about 70, 70 some million people in the Medicaid program. The rest are on Medicare. We have about 11 million individuals being served in the individual exchanges. The amount of transactions, the claims. I mean, one of the things I think even during COVID, it just recognizes that you know, it's almost a third of the federal budget and pretty much every healthcare institution in the country is getting some sort of Medicaid, Medicare reimbursement, or they're getting reimbursed by private insurers through the exchange. So we're touching all of that. What sort of levers do you have to work with here? What authorities and regulation or law, what kind of stakeholders are you dealing with? Our stakeholders are obviously Congress, and typically CMS has been that agency where Congress passes a law and it's CMS's responsibility to implement it. CMS is actually a sub-agency of the larger cabinet department. You've probably heard of Health and Human Services, and so we are under Health and Human Services along with the FDA and the CDC. But to just give you a sense of scope, even NIH is involved with, is, is under HHS, but we are 90% of the budget within HHS. So we always kind of think of ourselves as the 90 pound gorilla inside of HHS. I'd love for our community to know about your story, how you've come to healthcare and, and what it is that inspires you. 
Well, you know, I thought originally when I was in college that I would go to medical school. And uh, at the same time, while I was in college, I was uh, getting involved in student government. So my eyes were sort of open to the, the whole policy piece. And, you know, even though I graduated with a degree in science, life sciences, I think what I started to understand is that when it comes to healthcare, that there's a lot more that's going on in healthcare than the, the individual experience the patient is having with their doctor. And so I went into public health. I went to, to Hopkins and focused on policy and, you know, really opened my eyes to all of the issues surrounding healthcare. Um, went to work in a public health department and a public hospital. So that was sort of ground zero for a lot of healthcare, a lot of policy. Um, not only seeing the public health side, but, but sort of seeing a lot of uninsured patients. So you're seeing a lot of what's broken in our healthcare system, people that can't afford care, even when they're getting care, we're not able to impact their outcomes because there's a lot of other things that are going on in their lives. You see hospitals struggling because they can't afford to provide care and not get reimbursed. And so, like I said, it was ground zero. And, you know, I guess I'm the kind of person that likes to get things done. If there's a problem, I want to solve it. And um, it was at that point, my experience was that it wasn't going to ha- the hospital couldn't fix these problems. We couldn't address the uninsured, couldn't address some of these things unless there were larger reforms. So I started working at the state level. Um, I started my own consulting firm, gave me a little bit of flexibility, raising two children, got engaged with a lot of the Indiana leadership, Governor Mitch Daniels at the time. He wanted to pass a cigarette tax is kind of how the story went. First time he tried, he wasn't successful. And part of the issue was, what are you going to do with the money? And so I talked to him about, you know, could we do something around the uninsured? And I always like to tell the story that I said, well, you know, you could expand your Medicaid program. And he looked at me like I had two horns growing out of my my head. Um, But we went on to, in his term, create a small Medicaid expansion program. This was pre-ACA, but we did it in a way that, you know, he felt comfortable This is a person that ran the federal budget and didn't want to see another entitlement program, but also wanted to still help people. And so I just kind of went about designing a program for him and then went on to work with other states that were looking at that time the Affordable Care Act had passed. Mitch Daniels asked me to kind of head up Indiana's response. So I started to really delve into a lot of the regulations and into the nitty gritty. And then I started to work with other states as well that were considering and and addressing the same issues, the uninsured, Medicaid expansions. Um, And then uh, Mitch Daniels left. There was a uh, congressman from Indiana that was going to run for governor. And they said, well, maybe you should talk to her. She knows a little bit about Medicaid. So I sat and talked to him. And that was uh, Governor Pence at that time. And uh, um, and then the story is uh, uh, Governor Pence went on to be the vice president and kind of helped them through the campaign. And um, then they asked me to be the CMS administrator. I was the seventh nominee of the Trump administration. Wow. So you were appointed before the Secretary of Health and Human Services. We were actually appointed together. So when they when they made the announcement, it was uh, myself and Tom Price at the same time. Right. Now, the, the president and the administration had some really clear priorities in health care and also famously said, honestly, this is pretty complicated stuff. So how much scope did you have? What was the relationship like with the president and with the White House? You know, when we started, obviously, they were focused on the repeal and replace. And, you know, the president didn't like the idea of repealing and then replacing and wanted to do it all together. And I was sort of one of those people that, again, I'm not from DC, have no idea how Congress works, but I like that idea because I thought, you know, hey, I know what it's like to be running a state and having uncertainty in healthcare. And for the last few years, that's all we had. You know, we didn't know when regulations were gonna come out. And I know how hard that was for hospitals. Do we hire people? You couldn't do anything with all of that uncertainty. And I didn't think that was a good idea to continue it. So when he said it, I said, well, I think that's exactly spot on. So, you know, we would have some private conversations. I still remember one where they were looking for me. I just happened to be in the White House. And so I just went and sat with him in the Oval 
and we were talking about the bill and I had just had some concerns with the way that it was structured. And I, and I said to him, I said, what do you want to be remembered for? What do you want your legacy to be? You don't want to be the guy that took away health care. And that really resonated with him. And although he wasn't a, a health care policy wonk, I think he did strongly believe that people should have health care. And I know that's surprising to many people. He didn't like the Affordable Care Act, but I think he did believe that people should have health care. We had some commonality that we needed to do better for the American people to make sure that they had health care when they needed it. You must have had very clear goals, and we want to get into how you set goals in your goal-setting system. But what does it take to be an effective leader in government? One of the things I would say in government is that there's so many layers. There's a lot of bureaucracy. Anytime you want to do something, the first response you'll get is, you know, 20 reasons why you can't or shouldn't do something. So in order to be successful in government, you have to push past that. You have to be very goal-oriented. This is what I want. And you have to be tenacious. You have to push back, push past all of those barriers. Recognize you're going to have a barrier every single you know, step of the way. When we started to talk about telehealth, first response, well, we can't do that. Well, you know, there's the, the so it's like, okay, well, let's write down all the reasons why we can't do this. And then we're going to work through those reasons. So you have to be tenacious to be able to, to get through that and push people along. One of the things I think that helps in government that helped with CMS is defining that goal and purpose. When people understand why they're doing something, they're a lot more engaged. You know, more than any other agency that I'm aware of, you deeply embraced a goal setting system, OKRs. I'd love to hear the story of both how and why you did that. When I came to CMS, I had run a small company and it was a, a tiny little company. It was very easy to have alignment. You spent a lot of time with your employees. They worked personally with you on a bunch of projects. So it was easier. And then I come to this big, large, sprawling organization, and there's so much going on. Um, even just getting your arms around, well, what, what is everybody doing? What is everybody working on? I'd probably describe CMS as almost like a bunch of musicians. You've got the piano players here, you've got the drums over there, and everybody's kind of doing their own thing. And they're great. They're making beautiful music, but they're all kind of doing their own thing. And even as a leader to come in and put your arms around, what are you doing? That, that was very hard. And a lot of, I think, administrators that I've spoken to, they get focused on a few priorities. For the Obama administration, they had the Affordable Care Act. So, you know, all hands on deck. They're focused on implementing a large piece of legislation. Same thing with Part D um, and the Bush administration. So, you know, I think it's been natural that a lot of these administrations have been focused around a, a huge initiative. But um, we didn't have that with the Trump administration. So it was almost thinking about what putting together this agenda. We did a large listening tour where we went across the country. We talked to innovators, providers, and patients. And so we had a pretty good idea of here's all the things that I want. Here's how I want to do them. But how do you get all that done? And I remember being advised, just, you know, once you pick out three or four things that you want to get done. And I thought, well, look, I'm commuting back and forth and I'm leaving my family behind. I don't want to get four things done. I want to do everything I can in my time here to affect as much change as possible. And I'm sure this won't be the case, but I didn't want to look back at this time saying, well, I wish I would have done this and I wish I would have done that. And I'm sure I'll get to that point, but I'd like to keep that list as small as possible. So, John, you know, my uh, introduction to OKRs was this. You and I had been talking. We had never talked about OKRs. We had been talking a lot about interoperability. But I happened to be at the airport, uh, delayed flight, and I'm just looking at the great bestsellers, and I see your book. And I was like, oh. Well, I know John and I've got it. I've got some time here in the airport. So I bought the book and I started reading it. So I don't know if it was just serendipity. And I called you afterwards, um, but it was sort of a serendipity where I'm coming into this organization. I'm trying to get a lot of work done and I don't feel like we're getting there. And I was frustrated as a leader. I wasn't getting the results that I wanted to get. Um, happened to read the book and recognize that 
we needed to do something to pull the whole agency together, to have alignment, to have shared goals, to have an understanding of what we were trying to achieve and to deliver it and to deliver it in a way that was organized. You know, I didn't want to have a meeting and then say, well, where's this and where's that? So it gave us a framework in terms of trying to organize our goals, our accomplishments, and holding people accountable. So I have two big questions for you. One is, what are CMS's goals? And the second is, how did the OKR system help you achieve them? Did it help and how? You know, in CMS, we sort of operate more on an annual cycle. So we have to really think about how do we adopt these OKRs for CMS? And what we found, we had it adopted in the sense that We have a variety of different measures. We picked out three for the entire agency, and that was around bending the cost curve, increasing quality, and pushing value. So those were sort of like these top three for the entire agency. And then we had 16 strategic initiatives, and those initiatives had an objective. What were they trying to do? So for price transparency, right, we want to achieve... That was the overall objective. And then we had key results. So we had overall ones. We had 16 initiatives. And then, and I think this is actually really um, important to all of this. We also then had for every division. So Medicare had their OKRs. Medicaid had their OKRs. And then we had all these other components in the agency like human resources you know, our clearance process, where they also had OKRs. And I think that was so critical to all of this, because a lot of times leaders are, they're just focused on, these are the two or three initiatives that we want to get done. We are introducing a new health program, Affordable Care Act or Part D. But now we were saying, oh, wait a minute, the entire agency has to think about What is your goal? What is your objective? And so we brought the team together and we collectively helped each other's components. So for example, human resources, there was a lot of dissatisfaction. It was taking too long to hire people. And people said, well, in Medicaid, I can't achieve what I'm going to achieve if human resources isn't doing what they're doing. So we then had OKRs for each and every department inside the agency, our IT department. Our communications teams had OKRs as well. So it just went across the entire agency. So we had three common ones, but then they were sort of broken down according to uh, the different departments. And did this system, I like to say it takes time to build goal muscle, did this system become part of the language or the operations of CMS? Would people bring up these trade-offs in meetings or how did, how did you use them day in and day out? I think the biggest thing that it created was the alignment. You know, I talked about as a leader being frustrated that a lot of times I felt like I wasn't communicating or that they didn't understand what I wanted. And then the conversations that we would have around our objectives, and you know, those first drafts of the objectives and they weren't, they weren't great. And we had, they were iterative. It took us a long, you know, we had to discuss it. What are we trying to achieve? Well, why do you have that, you know, objective? Is that even reasonable? One of the things we had to sort out were the differences between what can we do in one year versus three years? Is this really our responsibility? We want to bend the cost growth curve, but does CMS really have the ability to do that? But again, it was important to at least set that goal forward. It did take a lot of training of the team to explain what an objective and what a key result was. And that was an iterative process to even understand what it was, but then discussion around what the actual results were, what the actual objectives were. I think for me, what it really helped is in an agency like CMS, people are coming at us all the time, right? You know, there's this priority, this problem. It helped us under its alignment. You know, this is what we're trying to achieve. We want to have greater competition. We want to have site neutral payments. So it actually helped us block out the noise. We're not going to work on this. This isn't one of our priorities. And, you know, there's always some things that you have to do that always exactly line up to your priorities that the White House calls you or Senator so-and-so, you know, you got to make a little bit of room. But generally, it really helped us decide what are we going to work on? What's important? What are we focused on? 
The uh, research shows there's five benefits from an OKR goal setting system. You know these, they're focus, alignment, commitment, tracking, and then stretching to do really ambitious things. And, and you've called out SEMA alignment as being one of the big benefits. Was there a second or third out of those five, or did you get all five of them in equal measure? I think I got one of the ones that I want to talk about are the, the measurable results. And one of the things that we did at CMS for the first time was put together a dashboard. And we would have discussions about the dashboard. So, for example, we would track our Medicare spending, you know, just spending up in what areas and well, what's going on here. So having those results, I think, was really important. In the exchanges, we said, well, we want to have more choices. We want to make sure that we don't have areas of the country that only have one insurer. This is our goal. What are we going to do to get there? So the dashboard was really important. And that was difficult because I think it's very easy to say, well, we want a quality healthcare system. But what did, what did that exactly mean? What is the tangible piece? The other thing that we recognize with CMS is that a lot of times they didn't even have the baseline. You know, So we said, we want to create more competition between surgery centers and hospitals. Okay, well, we changed the rule, great. But, you know, they didn't measure it. They didn't even know what the baseline was. And so I think there was also a lot of recognition about some of our gaps in data, but the outcome of having a dashboard and having a system of tracking these OKRs was also something that was really powerful. Many large organizations find that Adopting a new system, a goal system like this, requires justification. It requires commitment from the leadership. In fact, I'm fond of saying if your leader and CEO aren't committed, don't even try. People view this, uh, they're busy. This is one more thing to do. It's kind of a, an additional work tax. Did you encounter that kind of skepticism and resistance? And if so, how did you deal with it? One of the things that I think was really important that we did early on is um, in CMS, as in every federal agency, you have the political appointees and then you have the career staff. And I didn't want this to be just a political thing that got done for a couple of years. I really wanted this to be a part of the institution. And so we brought leadership and we had the career staff actually lead this effort. I think that was really important to buy in and to longevity. From a leader perspective, what I found worked was I had to actually myself really go and sit with them. There was no way that it was going to be an independent process. Like we had to really sit down with them. And I met literally with each component, had a discussion. What are you trying to achieve? Why? Does that make sense? And so it was hard and it was tedious, but what came out at the the back end was just a lot more satisfaction. They understood what they were doing. But I think it's fair to say there was a lot of resistance. And some of that also has to do with not understanding it. You know, I think understand what's an objective, what's a key result, and giving them some flexibility. The other thing that we encountered was there's sometimes fear. Well, if I set at this objective, well, what if I can't achieve it? Am I going to look bad? So we had a lot of let's set the bar really low um, so that we can achieve it. So we had to make it very clear, look, this isn't going to be a part of your performance review. And I think that was one of the suggestions that you had where it was, this isn't a part of your review, but we really need to think about what is that main goal? So I think some of those things were really helpful. We had to tweak it as well because we had to sort of say, okay, here's your one year and your three years. So you may have an objective that's a one year. And this year, I want to get my rule out. In three years, I want to see more services going to surgery centers. So that also helped. So we had to be flexible in how we set them up and the, and the timeframes. There's so much at stake in healthcare for the country, and it is a political process. Were you concerned or were there concerns that in setting ambitious goals and not achieving them, that your agency would be criticized on Capitol Hill or in the press? Was that a potential problem? And if so, how did you think about it or deal with it? In terms of the objectives and things like that, I actually think it was helpful for the stakeholder community when we clearly laid out, here's our 16 strategic initiatives. This is what we're trying to achieve. I actually think that it created, again, greater alignment because we're very clear on where, what the agency is trying to achieve. Now, maybe three-fourths of the way through your service, uh, a funny thing happened. It was the most important event probably of our 
of our lifetimes, and that's the, the pandemic, the COVID virus. How did that affect you when you first learned about it? And then how did it affect the agency? So, you know, we started to hear about it. I mean, just, I think all of us watching the news reports and I've got a a public health background. And to me, it was alarming because you've never seen anything like that. You've never seen China shut down cities, shut down schools and, you know, having conversations. I think we were concerned if it hit the nursing homes. And that was kind of, we said, look, if this hits the nursing homes, we're really in trouble. That was a Thursday, Saturday morning, all over the news. They're talking about the life care facility, all of these patients being evacuated. And honestly, we just I just went into high gear. I was still in Indiana that weekend and started to make arrangements. I wanted to make sure the CMS team was on the ground. You know, this is a $1.3 trillion agency. So we had to make sure that operations were still going on because if we stop, the whole healthcare system stops. You know, we are the biggest payer. Um, And the agency had to go virtual in in a matter of a week. This day, we're all working in the office. And then the next day, we were um, virtual. So I was very lucky to have an incredibly dedicated team that worked around the clock. Um, Not once did I ever, ever hear um, a complaint of we're working too much, we're working too hard. These people were just doing whatever they can. And again, you know, also they're managing their own lives. They're having to work at home. They're managing children. Uh, We started our COVID calls. um, and We'd have about 150 people from CMS on these calls. And uh, we said, okay, we're going to do telehealth. And it wasn't, we're going to do telehealth and Medicare. It's like, we're going to do telehealth as an agency. So here's the vision. Here's what we want to do. Now, how do we all execute? Medicaid, what do you need to do to make sure we have telehealth so that children can get services and pregnant moms can get services? Medicare, what do you need to do? Medicare Advantage, what do you need to do? So it was bringing everybody together every day. Everybody got to hear what was going on. So maybe it wasn't your topic, but you could hear everything that was, that, that was going on. So very intense but I've been very proud of the way CMS responded during this time. And I think we've made it possible for the healthcare system to do their job. If you reflect for a moment, where is the place that the OKRs made the biggest difference? Would it be COVID or some other gnarly part of the agency that you had to wrangle into? I think, <laughs> it, I think it brought us together as really? one team. You know, CMS has really functioned in silos. Medicare did its thing. Medicaid did its thing. And we came together as an agency. And, you know, I heard a lot of people say when I first started the job, you know, oh, it's just so big and there's all these different programs. But when we started to bring the team together, there was a greater understanding that the problems in Medicare, in Medicaid, in the exchanges were actually all the same. The rules may be different, but the problems were the same. And if we wanted to make these programs better, more sustainable over the long term, then we had to focus on problems that we're all facing. So if you think about price transparency, interoperability, those were some initiatives that fell across the entire agency. Anytime we started it, they all kind of came together. Interoperability, a great example, that actually fell across the exchanges, Medicare and Medicaid on on interoperability. So I think that the greatest gift was alignment. And the other piece of it is the agency had a better understanding of what was going on. Satisfaction went on, Mm. employee satisfaction. I think people want to know what's going on. They want to be a part of something larger than what's the task right in front of them. And so I think it, you know, brought, like I said, I think we are closer um, as an agency and people are more satisfied because they had a better understanding of what the larger mission and goals were. You very clearly get the sense that you're action oriented. You were in a crisis and you've been effective. You needed to be effective as a leader, both at the state and federal level. You must have had very clear goals. With COVID, that was very clear. It was like, we're in a crisis. And not only do we have to move, we have to move fast. Speed was very important. You know, every day that we lollygag and not get a rule out, that means somebody's life could be at stake because they couldn't communicate via telehealth. So I think understanding the why behind the goal and behind the purpose is really important. All of those investments in that time that we had taken, we had greater alignment. So when COVID hit, it was okay. 
the waivers. We're going to have states coming to us with waivers and we cannot take six months to turn around a waiver. Let's figure out how are we going to do this? So a lot of the investments that we made kind of paid off dividends in the long term. It is very inspiring. It makes me want to go to work in CMS. So <laughs> hats off to you. I, I, I wonder what would be your advice to the next administrator, both about the mission and about goal setting? Right before I left, we were talking about OKRs, and I asked the team, the career staff that had been guiding this, I said, you know, what do you think about it? Is this something you're going to continue doing? And they said, absolutely, 100%. And the chief operating officer said, look, you know, obviously the initiatives are going to change, right? We may not be working on rural health or interoperability, but the structure and the process is all the same. And she said, my plan is to go to the next administrator and say, you know, here's the process. Tell us what your initiatives are. And then you're just plugging in these initiatives. But underneath them, for every initiative, you're going to define what the objective is, what's the key result. And I think as a management tool for the administrator, it gives you a better understanding of what's everybody working on, kind of ties everybody together. When COVID started, I had to go back over the objectives and key results or the objectives to say, okay, these aren't priorities anymore because we're in the middle of the pandemic. There's no way the agency is going to be able to get all this stuff done. And it was very easy for us. I mean, it took a few hours. We just quickly went through the list and kind of said, yay, nay, on hold, um, eliminate. And had we not had all of that organized, you know, that could have taken us weeks and it would have taken our focus away from, from COVID. So it's a great tool, even for the next administrator. You can see exactly what's going on in the agency. And if you disagree with it, you can change it, but at least it's all laid out. How would you say we should continue to improve this vital healthcare system for the most vulnerable and the elderly in this year, 2021, and beyond? Well, one of the things, I mean, we have a lot of conversation about getting people more health insurance. We want to make sure people are covered. And those are obviously good goals. We want to make sure that every American has access to health care. But we've got to start really focusing on some of the underlying problems in our healthcare system. You know, why is it broken? Why don't people have access? Well, it's too expensive. Well, why is it too expensive? What are the things that are driving this? Putting more people on a government program doesn't fix the problem. It just moves the problem, you know, to, to the government. So I think that's one, one piece of it. The second part of it is we can't forget about the patient and the patient experience. You know, the, a lot of the solutions that you see out there, I think, aren't going to address the day-to-day -day hassles that the patients are going through. You know, the other thing I was thinking about is that the government won't get involved in something when something is going well. And so for all those people that are looking for the government to step in to fix healthcare, you know, I would say to healthcare, to doctors, to insurers, fix it yourself. Um, stop waiting for the government to do it. Because if you are doing a good job and people are happy, government won't, they won't be intervening. They only intervene when there's a problem and people are largely dissatisfied with healthcare. Um, there's a lot of good in our healthcare system, but there are a lot of things that, uh, you know, it's not just even people that have healthcare and have health insurance have a whole litany um, of concerns. And so I hope that our healthcare system can really focus on patients. And if we're doing the right things, that'll result in less government intervention. There won't be as much need for it. Seema Verma, it's clear to me, it's clear to our community that you are a fierce and fearless leader. So uh, I, I want to thank you for your courage, your, your vision, your service, and your leadership. You are amazing. Thank you. Thank you.